Hi, everyone. I'm Siobhan Sarna, and it is a pleasure to have you here. This is, um, well, first of all, who am I? Founder of SIBO SOS, the creator of this year, by the end of the year, nine summits. Um, we're in the Liver Gallbladder Rescue Summit sign up period right now. Please join us. Kieran was kind enough to participate in that summit and talk about the microbiome and the liver and the gallbladder. And then I have a replay of the Lymphatic Rescue Summit in case you missed that last year in June. And then in October, it's the fascia, fascia, that layer underneath our skin that, that really is holding us together. It's the fascia rescue summit coming up in October. I'm very excited about that. So um, that's what's coming up. Who is Karen Kirschlin? Karen is the co-founder of Microbiome Labs. You may be familiar with one of his star products, which is Megaspore. You may have heard of it before, may have thought, how can I get this? I can only get it at a practitioner's office. I remember that's what I had to do when I first learned about it. And I had a lot of confusion, Karen, when I was in Dr. Google land back in 2015, 16, about um, spore-based probiotics. And um, I, I want to get to you, so I'm going to wrap this up. But there was a myth out there in the internet land. I know you know what it is. And that was that they take over your microbiome. They reseed it. And then you're going to be like spores coming out of your ears and everything. Drama, drama. And I was scared of it. And then I met you and I was like, okay, I get it now. And so you're here today. Thank you so much to share this information with our community and also a nifty 15% off coupon. Even if you've ordered before, that is temporary. I'm so grateful to you for that. Um, but let's talk about the role of spore probiotics and the microbiome. I know you just are off traveling for like uh, the entire month of February. Thank you for being here. Yeah, of course. No, I got to be home one night in February, but, uh, but you know, you got to be out there. You got to be educating and all that. Uh, thank you so much for having me. Uh, I saw one of my friends pop in here, Sophie. Uh, so hi, Sophie. Uh, she had sent a message um, on there. Um, you know, Spores are super interesting when we look at their role in nature. So first of all, just for the nerds that are that are part of the group here, uh, just to give them a little background, bacterial spores were likely one of the first living organisms on this planet, right? So there's this there's this theory called panspermia, and the idea, and it, even though it sounds dirty, uh, it's a, it's a true scientific theory. Um, panspermia is the the theory of understanding where components of cellular life came from on earth, right? So we know that in order for a cell to exist, you have to have nucleic acids, which are what makes up your, your DNA and RNA structures. You also have to have amino acids, so proteins that make up a lot of the other things that, that the cells utilize to survive. And, and we also know that within that initial primordial soup, that was the early, early life of Earth, that some of these components were already there that all of a sudden coalesced and was able to form into a functioning cell. The big question is where did these components come from, right? So where did nucleic acids come from? Where did amino acids come from? And when you look at meteorites that crash on Earth, they have nucleic acids on them. They have amino acids on them. So the idea is that in the early stages of Earth, when it was being bombarded before the atmosphere built up, uh, and it was being bombarded by meteorites all the time, hence all the massive craters all over Earth, that many of these meteorites carried with it amino acids and, and, and nucleic acids and all that to, to seed cellular life on this planet. Then the big question becomes is, were these microbes? And if they are microbes, what kind of microbes that exist today can actually survive interstellar travel on a meteorite to get seeded on Earth? And they took these bacillus endospores, very similar to the ones we work with, and they, they can survive seven years in outer space. So what? they can certainly survive travel from Mars to the, US, uh, to the, to the Earth, yeah. to the US hopefully, um, and become some of the early seeds of cellular life on this planet, right? So it's, it's absolutely mind boggling that these spores that we're talking about as probiotics are very likely the very first life forms on earth. And in fact, were the seeds for cellular life on earth. So their role in our existence can't be overstated. And so when we think about them, when we think about 
what they really mean to us as a species, it becomes really daunting to, to try to wrap your head around, wow, this is like the foundation of where our cells come from. And then remember that the human functions through cellular communication, right? Every cell in our body needs to be able to communicate with the other cell in order for our system to work, this systems biology approach. And so the rules for how cells communicate with one another were written by these early organisms. So these bacilli, these bacillus endospores, know better how our cells communicate with one another than we do. And there's a language there that we haven't even tapped into. And so we see that when we do studies on the spores because we see things occurring that we cannot explain, but we know they're happening because of the scientific process, right? So, I, and I say all of this because it all sounds kind of esoteric and all that, but I want people to understand how significant these organisms are to our function, right? And, and what we're starting to see and what we've seen in the research is that when you add spores into the gut microbiome, they start to correct the microbiome, right? And that's the mind boggling thing about it because we don't know how to go in and correct the microbiome. We know how to measure the imbalance. We know how to look at the microbiome, look at sequencing data and go, oh man, diversity is low. These organisms are too high. These are too low. We know these are, you know, that's all upside down. That's not how it's supposed to be. And that's probably why this person is feeling the way they feel. That's why their motility is totally arrested. That's why they have the skin issues that they have. That's why they have anxiety. But it's so hard for us to go in there and manipulate it and fix it. At the same time, you throw in the spores. And before you know it, all of those things start to correct itself, right? And it sounds crazy. But we have the research, we have the data, and we've published it to show it. So I can't state enough how important these spores are for our basic functionality and how critical they are to repair the imbalances that are occurring within our gut. So Kieran uh, teaches, for those of you who don't know him, he teaches other researchers, other doctors, other practitioners, other Mike, you know, I have a new name for you, microbiome biologist. And <laughs> I, like uh, I don't know if that's a thing, but I hope I made it up and it's good. You can take <laughs> it. Um, so you know, this is going on for years now, traveling the globe and teaching people and very, you're very generous. I thank you so much for your mission and your work. And I wanted to go back to this because we've been talking about how your, you know, new Zen biome, um, psychobiotics, helping you with your sleep and your stress and the studies show that it works and it's out of stock right now, two particular products. Um, look for an email from us around the 15th, 16th of this month, because is it going to be, do you think it's back in stock, the <laughs> Zen biome? It, awesome. it will be, yes. How about it will that? be. March 16th. Um, so mark your calendars and we'll, we'll send you a coupon hopefully for that because we, and I did a conversation with Kieran, um, not streaming, but just, I had this, the schedule worked out. So we had this conversation about the psychobiotics and then it was out of stock. And so I didn't want to send that conversation because everyone's going to want it. So I held it and we'll send it out mid month. But the fact of the matter is, um, I, one of the summits I did was the microbiome rescue, gut and microbiome rescue summit, which of course Kieran was in. And what they're, I mean, the fact is, is that we are, we are bacteria. Ah, hello. So the studies are there. I think it's a lot of fear. And especially if you have SIBO and IBS, there's what I call SIBO panic. And so it, and I get it. I had it about like, I don't want to try anything new because fill in the blank. And you, I am a catastrophic packer. My purse is heavy. I like, I am like a prepper in certain ways because I do not want to be as uncomfortable as I have been. And so what if runs my life in a lot of ways, but it was way out of control for a while. Mm -hmm. And so I want to encourage anybody who's scared to just inch by inch, it's a cinch. Karen, if someone starts Megaspore, mm -hmm. can give us advice. Can they open the capsules? Can they sprinkle a little on food? How long, like, is it crazy if someone's super sensitive to take 10 days to get up to a full capsule? Cause that kind of sounds crazy, but I hear about other people taking a full cap, two caps a day, no problem. But that's yep. because everybody's their own snowflake, right? Their own yeah, microbiome snowflake. 
And it's not crazy if you understand what is happening with that, right? Alice, so, yes. so let's let's talk about SIBO people uh, to begin with. We know without a doubt that when you have SIBO, it is the presence of non-native bacteria to that region, the small intestine. The small intestine typically is made up largely of gram-positive bacteria. Uh, then every bacteria in the world can be uh, can be categorized as gram positive or gram negative, right? And the big difference between those two bacteria, our bacterium is gram positive, have a cell wall structure. Gram negative don't have a cell wall structure. And gram negative have these things called LPS within their cell membranes, right? So what tends to happen is in the small intestine, you get predominantly gram-positive bacteria, most of which are really ha happy, happy commensal organisms. And, and the other good thing about gram-positive bacteria is that because they don't have that LPS, that endotoxin, when they die, they're not releasing a toxin into the GI tract. And what's important to note is in the small intestine, there's a lot of bacteria dying all the time. And the reason for that is the digestive process that occurs in the small intestine. You've got bile that's moving through, you've got hydrochloric acid from the stomach, you've got pancreatic enzymes, you've got a food bolus moving through. All of that process kills bacteria. And so if you had a lot of gram negative bacteria in your small intestine, all of that dying bacteria would release this endotoxin all the time, causing inflammation in the small intestine, leaky gut in the small intestine, and then a whole host of other issues including stasis where the bowel is not moving anymore, right? So naturally, your small intestine is full of gram-positive bacteria. We know from lots of published studies that when you have SIBO, there has been what we call a taxa shift, where you end up with more gram-negative bacteria in your small intestine. So if you're somebody that's listening right now, and you, when you eat, you get bloated, and you have all this discomfort and indigestion and all that, you have shifted your small intestine to having more gram negative bacteria, right? Now, the spores do an amazing job at going into a system like the small intestine, finding and seeking out these gram negative bacteria and bringing down their levels. They do it in a number of ways. They compete against them for space and nutrients in, the, in that area. They can even produce antimicrobial peptides to bring them down. Right? So they're going to go in there. They're going to survey the system. The fancy word for that is called quorum sensing. They're going to identify the microbes that shouldn't be there and are there at too high levels. And they will sit literally sit around them and bring down those microbes. Right? So that's what's happening when you first take the spores. Now, some people experience that as a Herxheimer reaction because when some of these gram negative bacteria are getting killed off by the spores, they start fighting back and they start throwing out their toxins as a last ditch effort to try to survive the melee that the spores are giving them, right? And you will experience that as cramping, loose stool, bloating, you know, discomfort. Maybe you get tired and a little bit lethargic, but it depends on what type of gram negative bacteria you have dominant in your system. Some of them do this much more aggressively, others don't do it as much. So that's why some people can take a full capsule right off the bat right. and be and feel okay, not really feel anything. But if you have a lot of the types of gram negative bacteria that throw out a lot of toxins, then a, a, a quarter of a capsule might make you feel like, oh my God, there's a battle going on in my GI tract. Either way, it's a good thing. That's the key to keep in mind, right? You need that change to happen because SIBO is defined by this shift in taxa. And we need to go back to reduce the gram negatives that are in the small intestine and start allowing the gram positives to start to grow back. And the spores do that. They're going to do it at different intensity levels for different people. So you can absolutely start it. I would recommend everyone to start with half a capsule, maybe a quarter of a capsule to begin with. You can just pull the capsule apart, take what you estimate to be about a quarter of the powder, mix it in almost anything hot, cold water, you know, liquid, soft food, whatever you want, and take it in. See how you react, right? And if you feel fine with that, you don't have any really bad cramping and all that, then on the next dose, you can do it a little bit higher, right? Go half a capsule instead. Then as you get to a point where every other day you're upwards of a half a capsule to one capsule, then you can start introducing it every single day and do it once a day, one capsule a day, keep working your way up to two capsules. Now, at any point, 
if you go like, let's say you're going at half a capsule and you're doing great, you go to one capsule every other day and you're like, oh my God, that's too much. Just scale it back to half a capsule again and just keep that up for a little longer before you try to bump up, right? We have absolutely had people, it's rare, but we've had people where it's taken them upwards of six months to get to a full capsule, right? But when they do, yeah, doing phenomenal at that point, right? Okay, so. I really want to stress that. Mm -hmm. And I know a lot of people here have SIBO or you know some form of it in some stage of it, and a lot of people don't. So that's awesome. That's fine. I, I do talk about it a lot, but I just know that this is going to apply to everybody's microbiome mm -hmm. because the spores are gatekeepers, right? Yeah. They're the good neighbors that are making to the neighborhood watch. I don't know if it was Jason Harlock or you or Dr. Pimentel. I don't know who was the first person to make that analogy, but it's a beautiful one. And thanks for mm -hmm. sharing it with us. And that is, this is the sort of government of that city that is running you, that is the microbiome. So it's partly for me, like I have a tremendous amount of trust in mm -hmm. my own body, mm -hmm. even though it got off course and trying to bring it back, right? For my, my get, fixing up my mold and all that. But this is where you already said it, like, we're not totally sure how it works. We just know it does. Yeah. So Karen, I have somebody saying like, I have started Megaspore and I'm more constipated. Mm -hmm. So what I have started Megaspore and I feel amazing. I've started Megaspore and I am now feeling like a little achy. So mm -hmm. you talked about it. That's that Herxheimer, which in case you aren't familiar with the term Herxheimer, that's that die off. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Okay. Yeah. How is the spore bacteria? What's the name of the strain? So we have five in the megaspore, right? So we have Bacillus is a genus. And then the species is we have Subtilis, Indicus, Coagulans, Lycniformis, Clausi. So there's five different ones in there, you know, and there's a reason why there's five. So we, um, you know, we came up with this formula almost 10 years ago. And, uh, and we were really looking at it to mimic what should be happening, happening in nature, right? Because ideally what, you sh what should be happening is you still live off the land and you're still right. eating roots and tubers that you've dug out of the ground or you're hunting animals and you're gathering things and you're getting lots of these spores naturally through your food, but we don't anymore, right? And so what we're starting to see is the absence of spores in your system creates lots of dysbiosis because as a species, we've outsourced the regulation of the gut to organisms like this, right? And because I said, uh, as I said before, we don't have a way of doing it ourselves. So we've outsourced that function to microbes, microbes that mother nature intended us to get exposed to for the rest of the human existence, right? Mother nature did not anticipate that we would put ourselves in these sterile compartments and spend most of our time indoors uh, where we gain no exposure to the organisms. So we were looking at in the natural environment, what level of these spores you would get exposed to, what types of them you would get exposed to, and rarely do you find yourself getting exposed to naturally just one of them, right? They work in groups, they work in collectives. And so that's what we try to mimic with the collective. And as it turns out, it's super effective. So there are five strains in there and at slightly different proportions each, and we, in, and we change the dose of each based on what their functionality of each of the individual strains are within the GI tract, right? And so, and of course, we've done most of the research on spore-based probiotics. We've published over 10 studies so far. We have, I think, five others going on right now. And, and here's what's so important about it, because we talked about how they are the gatekeepers. You know, they're, the, as, as Siobhan said, they're like the government within that complex ecosystem of the microbiome. And when they start to correct things, right, you start to see all kinds of different effects taking place. For example, we've published studies on elevated triglycerides. We've published studies on acne. We've published studies on leaky gut and endotoxemia. We've published and or publishing a study on weight management, all with the same strains, right? These are all seemingly unrelated things and outputs. But the reason why the same strains can have all of these varied effects is because it's correcting the imbalances. And all of those imbalances in your GI tract is what's driving all of the conditions that you're experiencing. So if we start to correct the imbalance, and especially if you start adding in improvements in your diet and lifestyle and all that, 
you're really going to see profound changes. And that's what's, to me, the most exciting thing about the spores is it's giving us this kind of universal benefit. This is so big, okay? I, just speaking of this, this is a, a recent study talking about how weight, mm -hmm. um, overweight is, and you know, I've talked about this before, gut microbiomes can cause obesity and we're getting closer to understanding how, thank God. Um, I just saw that on Twitter from Dr. Pimentel's wife. But the thing is, is that, so on Valentine's Day, 2022, Dr. Mark Pimentel came on to our wonderful community and he gave an uh, hour lecture about what they've been up to. And to your point, Karen, confirmed, it's the overgrowth of Klebsiella and E. coli, both gram negative bacteria that are driving SIBO. Mm -hmm. And when those two overgrowths come down, and this isn't, I'm just going to stick in the, a certain lane for a second. When those two overgrowths come down, then harmony can be reestablished. And it's, you know, the same thing, this homeostasis. So for me personally, the way I use Megaspore is exactly the way you're saying to bring homeostasis back, to bring that gatekeeper. I've done tons of stool tests over the years, and it was very uh, non-diversified. And, yeah. and so that's why I like it is because I really feel like it helps me with everything we've been talking about. So here's the other thing. It is going to take time. Okay. Yes. <laughs> like how long did it take you to get here? It, and how long does, is it going to take you to get better? Someone's asking, and I do talk about this every so often with you, which is, do you take it uh, for a time period or do you take it for the rest of your life? And I don't think it was you. It was someone else who told me, well, do uh, our forefathers and mothers would go into the garden, pull up the carrots, pull up the, you know, radishes and the, the uh, potatoes and wash them up make them for dinner. You're getting, you know, every day you were getting not the right term re-inoculated, mm -hmm. not the right term, but that, so for me, I'm totally fine with eating a lot of diversity in my diet and doing my mega spore because I really feel like for me, it has been a good balance. Yeah. And this yeah. is a medical advice. Talk to your professionals. You know, I know a lot of people here are DIYing it in conjunction with people and it's great. You really need to decide how to experiment with it. Like some, you know, one bottle could last you a year. One bottle mm -hmm. could last you a month. It just depends on you, but you have to be curious. Yeah. So I want, I don't want anyone coming in going boom, boom, boom. I want you to have some flexibility around it and experiment with it a little bit. And that if you kind of give yourself permission to be an adventurer, an intergalactic dimensioner, mm -hmm. a dimensional adventurer, when you're talking about the meteorites, I think it softens some of the fear around it yeah. and it gives us resilience. So I just wanted to mention that because there's so much hope here. There's so much hope. Yes, there are. And, and, and that's the thing. And I, I love that, uh, that word that you're using hope because that's really the end of the day, my biggest motivation for how much I travel and why I go out and lecture and all that, because what I want to convey to people is all of the things, or lots of the things at least, that we've seen as being really difficult health problems to solve, or maybe there's no solution to it, or maybe this is, hey, this is just something you have to live with forever or manage, right? We now know that most of those are impacted by the microbiome, and often a simple change in the microbiome can really start to walk back those conditions, right? And, and because of that, it's such an exciting time to be, to be us, to be humans, and discovering how our system works. And simple tools like the spores can play a very significant role in really improving your outcomes. And so, um, you know, one of the things I wanna, I wanna reiterate that, that you said, it, it, when you think about how often to take it, right? And do you take it forever? Do you stop it at some point? All of the previous notions that you've heard about cycling probiotics and becoming monocultures, and all, it's all nonsense, right? So none of that's based on science. So let's talk about what the reality is. What we know about the spores is that they protect the system. Uh, we've published studies on the spore, or we're publishing a study on showing how the spores can actually reverse the damage that's occurring in a pediatric microbiome from Roundup and glyphosate, right? Whoa. We know that stuff is Huge. really toxic to the gut, right? And so what we did is we exposed a, a pediatric microbiome to Roundup, and we see all of these crazy 
dysbiosis and perturbation occurring in a pretty short amount of time. And then we continue exposing it to the Roundup and then throw in the spores and we start to see all of that reversing, right? We've done, we've published a study on damage to the microbiome by antibiotics and then adding in the spores. And then what we see is that spores start to walk back the damage from the antibiotics, right? So they're in there repairing. So then the question becomes, how much repair do you need? It's based on how much damage you're exposing yourself to, right? So if you live a pristine life and you're eating 100% organic, you're growing most of your stuff yourself, you don't use any sort of chemicals in the house and all that, you may not need it that often. You might be fine taking it once a week. But if you're like me and you're flying around everywhere, you're sitting on planes and eating food out of the airport and staying in hotels, you need it every day, right? So I take it every single day. So really you have to judge that based on your level of exposure, right? Okay. Um, the, the recovery and the repair is proportional to the amount of damage you expose yourself to. So I would say for the average person living an average healthy life, which is 70% the right decisions, 30% maybe not, <laughs> you probably need it every day or every other day, you know? And remember they're transient. They move through the system. They go in, they fix the problems, and then they cycle out. So they don't ever accumulate in there past a certain level. Right, so there was that, it was a famous blogger at the time who I had started to follow. And that was like the whole spore-based conversation. This was five years ago. So it's very, mm -hmm. it's definitely not prominent out there anymore, um, but it doesn't overgrow. And like, uh, it, it's not like mold where it is creating, the word spore can be tricky. Um, yeah. It's not like, it's not colonizing. Okay. It's not colonizing in your gut. It is coming in, having this, um, clean up, mash up, tidy up type thing. Think of these makeover shows, right? Mm -hmm. <laughs> and then it leaves this lasting impression. And then it, it, it keeps, you know, you have to keep taking it just like we were talking about with, you know, growing your own food and the like. So this is just one of the things that Kieran has done so beautifully, but um, he has other products, you know, and he's joined forces with the largest enzyme manufacturer in the world and mm -hmm. now can be playing with even more uh, products and strains. What's in the future for uh, mega, well, microbiome labs, I should say, Karen. Yeah. I know one thing I'm looking forward to, dental yeah. stuff, you guys. I'm so sure. excited. All right, tell us a little bit about what's to come. Well, and, and uh, the dental stuff, uh, you know, because we have a big focus on the oral microbiome. When, when we talk about SIBO, the biggest source to me of the dysbiotic bacteria in the small intestine comes from the mouth, right? Um, and then we also know that the dysfunctional oral microbiome drives a lot of dysbiosis in the gut. If you have the wrong microbes overgrowing lots of gram-negative bacteria in the mouth, you're swallowing them every single day, every single minute. Um, so it's a big source of dysfunctional bacteria. And, and here's the thing, 94% of Americans have some degree of gingivitis. Right. And those are all driven by gram negative opportunistic organisms. Right. So 94% of us have dysbiotic mouths. And let's and, take a minute to just absorb that for a second. Yeah. Which is okay. crazy. There's almost nothing that 94% of Americans have in common. Right. Uh, right. Except for a dysfunctional mouth. And so the <laughs> oral microbiome is so important. And so we've got a product coming out called BioFresh. Um, BioFresh will be out probably in the next uh, two or three months. And the idea behind that is using a mix of enzymes and other uh, compounds to reduce the noxious byproducts of bad bacteria in the gut. So in the mouth, sorry. Um, and, and so it starts with odor and it start, and then the second phase of BioFresh is called BioFresh Clean, which our whole goal was, can we replace the toothbrush, right? Can we make toothbrushing obsolete? Because you can, if you have the right technology, to actually uh, take a lozenge that will clean your teeth better than actual mechanical brushing, right? So that uh, we're doing a bunch of studies in that area. So lots of that is coming out. And all of that will clean up your oral microbiome so you're not inoculating your gut with bad bacteria all the time. What, what just came out uh, that Siobhan mentioned earlier was the Zen, Zen Biome, the psychobiotic. This thing 
curbs mood issues, uh, helps deal with stress and anxiety, improves sleep uh, indices. We've got seven published studies around that. Changes brainwave function, actually puts you more into a theta wave function where in this meditative flow state, right? Where you're very calm, your brain is working at a very high level, all of that through a bacteria. We're launching in less than uh, three weeks um, a, a probiotic bacteria that grabs onto H. pylori in the stomach and takes it out of the system, right? H. pylori wow. is an infectious agent in more than 50% of the people, and it drives all kinds of issues, right? It, it drives things like gastritis. So the people that feel all this swelling and bloating in their stomach when they eat, that's a gastritis-like feeling. Or gastroparesis, where you can't empty the stomach, right? So you eat not a lot of food and you feel really bloated and stuck. So that's uh, the lack of emptying of the stomach. Also, people have experienced ulcers or people that get reflux conditions. So GERD, right? Those are all driven by H. pylori. H. pylori is also a critical driver of SIBO. Right? H. pylori is a significant risk factor for developing SIBO. H. pylori is also a significant risk factor for fertility issues. So even though it's, it's in the stomach and it seems completely unrelated, it can drive fertility issues in both men and women. Right? And again, 50% of the population has infectious levels of it. And so we've got a probiotic bacteria, a lactobacilli, and, and it's a ghost probiotic, which means it's actually not even alive but it has a unique outer co uh, coating that has a strong affinity for H. pylori. And so when you swallow it, it goes in and it moves around in the stomach and it grabs onto all the H. pylori and takes it out without disturbing anything else about the microbiome, right? Wow. That is insane bacterial technology out there. That is insane. This is like right? stuff out of the movies. Totally. It, it, it's wow. So a lot to unpack there. Um, so I also did the Dental Health Connection Summit. Um, that was my most recent one. And um, that was that's a life changer right there if you all are interested in dental health. So um, and of course, it has the link for it and she can put it in there. But I, Karen, you know, I've been waiting. So I really hope I get to be one of the first persons to launch that new product. Yeah. That's one thing. And you'll come on and talk about it. Thank you. And then, um, you know, this is, this is breakthrough stuff. This mm -hmm. is why I bring the product creators on is because there's so many decisions. I have decision fatigue about a lot of things in my life. Right. And this is an area I don't want anyone to have decision fatigue over. I want you to have the education to make wise decisions, to make educated decisions. It's not all going to work for you, right? Yep. And I hope that you are being resilient enough to keep on going, okay? This is where the rubber meets the road. You're hearing about the research here from the person who's been doing the research and without an agenda, you can yeah. say, oh, he manufactures it. Yeah, you can, but also you're driving a lot of research for other people as well. 100%, yeah. Mm -hmm. This is, I mean, I know Karen, so I'm very confident in the intentions here. Yeah. Um, I, it, it's a beautiful set of circumstances and a beautiful set of intentions, which is to get people well and to educate them so they can make wiser decisions. There, We are really, I mean, this is cutting edge stuff. This is so exciting, Kieran. So in the next, I would say six months, it sounds like, I mean, H. pylori, you have a probiotic for H. pylori? Isn't that are crazy? you kidding? Do you yeah. know how many people I know who are struggling with H. pylori, pylori and they're buying, I'm good, I'm good with herbals, but they're buying like this tea and drinking eight cups mm -hmm. of it a day. I mean, this is very insidious stuff. It is. Um, and it's very hard to get rid of because remember, H. pylori has this ability to bore into the stomach lining and remain there forever. Um, so so we, we really have an amazing opportunity then to you know, control and obtain healthier levels of it because H. pylori being present actually below a certain level is perfectly fine and normal, right? It's when it goes above that certain level. Uh, and that's really what we're looking at because you also don't want to completely eradicate it. Uh, because it may play a role at low levels, right? So we there's there's some studies that show a risk you'd be completely eradicated, like you bomb it with you know antibiotics and so on. Um, but again, that's something uh, a decision you make with your doctor. But what we have then is a probiotic that supports healthy levels of it. Uh, and to answer the question, uh, somebody asked in the chat, when when is that coming out? That product is called PyloGuard, 
so PYLO Guard. Uh, and that's launching, I think, on March 16th. And of course, Siobhan will be one of the first to know about it and, and have access to it. And we'll do an incentive uh, and a code and all that, you know, like Yay. we like to do this support you and your audience and your mission um but that but that product and and it's a product that's available in canada too uh okay. in fact we have a health canada approved claim on it which is which is hard to do uh because the research is is, is so good on that strain so wow. it'll be available in canada it'll, it'll be available here in the u.s as well oh that's fantastic Guys, if you want to try it or anything else from Microbiome Labs um, in the United States right now, it is uh, No Bloat 15, getting you 15% off your entire cart. Um, and that is if you, even if you've already shopped with Microbiome Labs before, you have to use a special code and it's in the chat area. Just keep scrolling. And I know Clarissa is popping it in there periodically. But this is, a, thank you. This is a great opportunity for you to try it. Um, so if you have IMO, which is the methanogen overgrowth with severe constipation, that's what that does. Can Megaspore be good for me? From now, I don't tolerate any probiotics. Nicole, that's exactly the point we're trying to make. I hope you're going to do a SIBO treatment to help reduce the, those overgrowth levels. And then, you know, bringing in another gatekeeper mm -hmm. to help is the point. This is what we're yeah. talking about. And this is the experimentation uh, that we're talking about. Personally, prebiotics for me, and I know you sell a beautiful prebiotic, prebiotics scare me during the time mm -hmm. when people have SIBO and SIBO treatments. For me, that's something for later after total yeah. gut restoration. And there's a program for that with Karen as well. Um, so, and you can find that all on uh, microbiomelabs.com and the whole protocol for it there. But how do you feel about that? Do you feel like the waiting for the prebiotics is a good idea? Yeah, normally what we do when we work with people with SIBO, we, we don't start the prebiotics until month three almost, uh, because you can do some really important, um, you know, realigning of the microbiome, the movement of the bowels, the movement of the bowels is so critical, right? The bowels have to move in order for you to properly utilize prebiotics and all that. Um, so we work with the upper part of the GI a lot. We work with the with the stomach and, and bile flow and liver health and uh, HCL production, and then changing the microbiome, the small intestine. Once you get all of those things starting to move in the right direction, you can actually start um, micro dosing in small amounts of prebiotic. And, and the oligosaccharide based prebiotics are critical for that because they work clinically at tiny doses to begin with, right? So you don't have to take 20 grams of fiber, you can get 100 milligrams or 50 milligrams of a oligosaccharide that will start feeding the large bowel bacteria that need those compounds. And, and the thing is that becomes an important part of your healing because those bacteria in the large bowel are gonna take those oligosaccharides and convert them to butyrate and propionate and acetate. And those are the things that are gonna heal up the small intestine, all the inflammatory damage that has been going on through having SIBO and leaky gut and, and all that, right? So it, it becomes an important part of, of really revamping the system, but you're right. We, we typically wait till the third month for it. Timing is so important in everything and in life, but particularly in um, IBS, SIBO, that's like the, I would say once you're pretty educated about it, um, the biggest questions that I see in the Facebook group are ultimately timing questions. Mm -hmm. And so that's why I wanted to mention that. Um, so the other thing that I just wanted, so people, are, somebody's typing that everything's out of stock on your website. Not everything's out of stock. Do you guys have Megaspore in stock? We do. Yeah. Yeah. Megaspore is, we had Megaspore out of stock early in Jan, but it's been in stock for the last six yeah. weeks. So, yeah. so the Zen biome, the Zen sleep, um, that's out of stock right now. I just checked the yesterday, uh, but that's coming back March 16th. So, yeah. and we'll send you an email about it as a reminder. Um, you have a special protocol um, that I really like for after antibiotics, mm -hmm. systemic antibiotics versus rifaximin, yeah. which a lot of people in the SIBO world, IBS world are familiar with, and that does stay in the small intestine. But let's say I had a uh, UTI and I had to take Bactrim. Yeah. What do, I'm just talking for a friend. Mm -hmm. um, yeah. <laughs> what do you, um, what do you suggest? Cause it, it worked like yeah. a charm. Yeah, no, we, we started developing this antibiotic protocol um, for, our, for our patients in our Chicago clinic 
um, back in 2013, and we've been using it since then, and it, it works marvelously well. Um, so we have three probiotic products, really. The flagship is Megaspore. We have another one called HU58, which is a single strain Bacillus subtilis, high dose of it. And then the third one is called Restore Flora, which is a combination of spores and Saccharomyces boulardii. Uh, that was actually developed for nursing homes for antibiotic use, right? So we had a, a, a big request from a large nursing home group because most of their patients who are, are residents in the nursing home are on antibiotics all the time and they have all of this antibiotic associated diarrhea and so on. So we were developing a product to help, you know, soothe their GI tract. So what we do in our protocol is you do two capsules of Megaspore, two capsules of HU58 and two capsules of Restore Flora a day. So you separate them out, you do morning, uh, afternoon, evening, take each of them with a bite of food at least. Um, and you can do them in any order, it doesn't matter which two you're doing when, but you do that for three times as long as the antibiotic was taken, right? So seven day course antibiotic, you do this for at least three weeks. Um, and so you do it, you start it during the course of the antibiotics. There's no issue with doing it during the course of the antibiotics. It sounds nuts, right? I know that's like counterintuitive, but it's just not a problem. It's not a problem at all. And, and it's super important. Um, you know, it, it does, it, it reduces the opportunity for the dysfunctional bacteria to really take hold, uh, which they do well during the, during the course of antibiotics and especially things like yeast, you know, like, uh, like your, um, uh, you know, Candida. yeah, exactly. Candida and so on. Um, so it really, uh, helps reduce that risk. Um, but, but that works marvelously for most people. Uh, so let's see a couple of other questions. If you're going to do a binder with Megaspore, remember binders you don't want to do with any medications or any probiotics or any supplements. Um, what uh, put mine in there hasn't been answered yet. I'm trying to find your, I mean, I'm overloaded with questions, you guys. So I'm trying to do my best here. Um, okay. After doing the total gut restore, my next tool test showed high levels of most commensal bacteria. Is that common? Am I rebalancing any suggestions? No, I mean, really the goal here is to increase high, to higher levels of commensal bacteria, right? That's the first step. So the first step is let's get the diversity and the number of commensal bacteria higher. Uh, once you get them higher, then as you kind of refine your diet and all that and add diversity to your diet, you might balance them out uh, as you need to, to be healthy. Okay, sorry, you guys. I was reading the chat. Thanks, Michelle. I, I, they basically look almost identical. Sorry, guys. I'm back to the Q and A box. Sorry, sorry, sorry. That was bad on me. Um, okay, let's see. Do spore probiotics help with the archaea that are responsible for the IMO? So different, but the yep. similar. I'm going to say similar. Totally. I mean, even though archaea, archaea, different types of microbes they're all still, still susceptible to the same competitive forces that occur within the microbiome, right? So we know the spores can influence viruses. We know they can influence um, fungi. We know they can influence archaea as well. They produce compounds that can inhibit the growth of most other microbes uh, that are pathogenic or, or um, you know, unfavorable. So absolutely, they can, to they can totally help. And we, we, even though we haven't published a study specifically on archaea, we have all of this empirical evidence that it that it does. Okay, so here's the thing. Talk to your doctor. But the thing is, this is this. I say that, and of course, all medical advice do run by your professionals, but you have to find people who know what they're talking about, okay? Mm -hmm. I mean, that that's all. They could, like Dr. Run Three Miles, the first GI doctor I ever went to that's in my book, Healing SIBO, he was amazing at scoping. Mm -hmm. Like, like he was a legend when it came to scoping, he didn't know squat diddly about SIBO. Mm -hmm. And so like, that would have been great if I, you know, like colonoscopy, super, but you have to find somebody who's educated about the microbiome. Right. right. And, and thank right. God you're doing this conference in April, which I'm yep. totally late and getting my stuff to them about, by the way. <laughs> um, so you, you really need to find people who are literate in this, who don't think you're nuts, who aren't just like, oh yeah, eat yogurt, you'll be fine. Right. Mm -hmm. It's not the same. It is not the same. Um, what do you think about butyrate as a supplement? Um, so, okay. So taking butyrate orally is, um, 
not quite a natural thing, right? So you do get some of it from butter and things like that naturally, but there's still scientific question as to the level of bioavailability and more importantly, bioaccessibility of butyrate when you take it in uh, as a supplement. Um, because remember, butyrate in the natural form is largely being produced in your large bowel. And the large bowel has absorption, transport, and all that for butyrate. So the big question is, does oral butyrate um, you know, get to the large bowel? And does it get absorbed? Or does it get dismantled in the small bowel going through stomach acid and all that? So I would always say that you're best off trying to increase endogenous butyrate production. And it's easy to do, right? Just, just taking the spores alone increases butyrate production by 50%. So, wow, that's amazing. That's amazing. And we've published that, that information, right? So, um, so, so that, you know, focus on trying to get it uh, to increase naturally. Are there, uh, and, and we love Steve Wright and he has Tributerin X and people's lives have been changed by that. So if you want to supplement, I do recommend that. But everything Kieran said is, is fantastic as well. Um, I wanted to ask you about uh, this one question right here. Uh, wait, I just saw it. Hold on. Okay. I remember now this kind of covers like six people's questions. Who is the spore bacteria megaspore not for? Are there any counter indications to that? The only one we've always said, um, uh, with, with having worked with these spores for more almost a decade now, um, are people who are like transplant patients who just had like a liver transplant and you're on very heavy immunosuppressant medications because the spores do interact with your immune system and they upregulate your T cells and B cells and all the good stuff that you want. But in those patients, they're in a very sensitive place. We don't want to mess with any of that, right? So, so that's the only extreme condition in which I can think of that I would say outright, okay, you should stay away from it and wait uh, until you're off those medications. Other than that, I mean, there really isn't. You know, when I, I, I have a couple of friends who have these young boys, they're, they're, this couple has the young boy, boys, and I saw them recently on Facebook, um, hadn't seen them in about two years, and, and oh, well, their weight has changed dramatically. Mm -hmm. in a very short period of time. And because Tom's talking about being really underweight, Tom, these people are not underweight anymore. They used to be just like average. And now they're definitely obese. And I, I, my heart broke for them. And I'm like, what happened? Yeah. Did, and you see it in families sometimes, like, did you guys take, did you guys get sick and take rounds of antibiotics and did not do something to balance that out? Yeah. This is this is what all of this is is talking about here. If you are underweight, if you are overweight, is do you feel, Kieran, that that is uh, assuming you're taking the right amount of calories in, like the calorie game is not all it's cracked up to be. It's not that yeah. simple. Do you feel like the microbiome can drive being underweight and overweight and can be the answer to balancing it? Yeah, absolutely. I mean, there's there's something called energy harvesting, which is controlled by the microbiome, right? So you could take two people and you can give them, uh, let's say a thousand calorie meal, the same exact meal. One person will get 1200 calories out of it. The other person might get hundred calories out of it, right? It can be that drastic based on what their microbiome looks like. So their ability to harvest energy from that food is different. And remember the calorie concept is really like, I don't know if people are familiar with how you measure calories, right? So you take a food and then you burn it. And you're basically measuring the joules of energy that come out of burning the food, like physically burning it with fire. And that gives you the caloric content of the food. So it's not necessarily a measure of what is happening to the food in the, in the human digestive tract. It's a laboratory measurement of how much energy is in the food when you light it on fire, right? So that's, that's the, um, the important thing to keep in mind. So even though we, we use this word calorie, as a gospel, it doesn't mean that if something says it's a thousand calories, that that's the only amount of actual calories someone will get out of it, or that is the amount of calories you will get out of it, right? So you might be able to get more calories out of it or far less, but it all depends on how your microbiome treats that food. Someone had a transplant 20 years ago 
are they are the spores okay for them? Yeah, absolutely. I mean, uh, they're probably on a maintenance level of an immunosuppressant, right? Um, so they're they're absolutely fine. Does radiation treatment for cancer destroy the microbiome? Radiation destroy it. Destroy might be a strong word, but it absolutely does impact the microbiome. Yes. So if you are on chemo, radiation, those are great places to be focusing on your gut and ensuring that your gut microbiome is healthy. Can we talk for a second about the stool test at uh, Microbiome Labs? We have three minutes left. Mm -hmm. um, what tell, talk to me about that because I know there are a lot of people here are very interested in that and they're yours is fairly new mm -hmm. compared yep. to like some of the old standbys and so tell us about about that yeah I mean one of the reasons why it's relatively new is we've been watching the sequencing technology for years right and and the fact of the matter is the technology even three four years ago was not there to be able to accurate accurately map out the microbiome and so what companies did is they became heavily focused on pathogens and they use PCR, for example, right? PCR is like a polymerase chain reaction, which is a way of um, using small probes to find pieces of DNA of certain bacteria, very specific bacteria, and then amplifying the, that, that sequence to read whether or not that bacteria is there. But the problem with PCR is it doesn't give you a really good map of what the actual community looks like. Because what you're doing in is you're going in and you're going, I'm looking for this one organism. Ah, there it is. And then you pluck it and you amplify it, right? And then you present it on a report like, hey, there's a lot of this in there. But it's actually not true because you went in and amplified that one organism. And you're not looking at what else is around there. And one of the things I always say about understanding the ecosystem of your microbiome is it's not only important what's there, it's equally important as what else is there, right? Because- What's not there. Yeah, no, no, so yeah, what else is there and, and absolutely. So for example, you could have an organism that is seemingly a problematic organism, right? But because there's another organism that, that counteracts its function, it's not actually causing you a problem. But if, you're, if your sequencing is actually just going in and looking for that one organism, it may present to you as if you have this one problem, right? And not giving you the context of everything else that's there, right? Does that make sense? Because- Yeah, go ahead, yeah. keep explaining though. I'll, I'll, give you, I'll give you an example of context, right? Just to make it uh, metaphorically, people can understand. If, if I'm a city planner, right? And I'm planning a new neighborhood and I'm trying to figure out all of the important uh, distribution of, of people and job functions and all that within the neighborhood. And then you came to me and you asked me and you said, are five police officers enough for this neighborhood, right? My first question to you is, well, how many people are in the neighborhood, right? Because is it five police officers policing a neighborhood of a thousand people or a hundred thousand people, right? that makes a difference. So the context of what else is there makes a difference. So you can't look at, at the demographic of any given town and go, that town only has five police officers, that place is going to hell, right? Well, it's perfectly fine if there's a thousand people in the town. And so that's the same thing with microbiome analysis, right? So what companies have been doing is they've been just looking at singular points of data without all the context. And it's really hard to understand the context because microbiome is so complex. When you sequence it, you pick, you pick stool samples and you're taking DNA out of the stool samples. You're literally getting trillions of genes in there, right? That you then have to sequence and put in certain order and figure out which genes belong to which bacteria and then put them all end to end and identify the bacteria. And once you do all that, then you have to go through all this software to map it all out to get a sense of what that microbiome looks like. So that technology didn't really exist in usable format until just two or three years ago. Right. And so we were waiting and following the technology and the research around that. Now, when it finally became available, now we use that. And that's called whole genome sequencing. And it's called shotgun whole genome sequencing for the nerds out there that want to know that. And so now what we can do and what, what our testing does 
is it gives you a true full mapping of your microbiome. And it looks most importantly at functional groups of bacteria because there are certain functions within your microbiome that are conducted by groups of organisms. And the proportion of the different groups matters because that tells you how your microbiome tends to act, how your microbiome tends to respond to things like foods and behaviors and lifestyle and so on. So this is the first true fully mapped functional microbiome analysis. And it'll give you insights into things that you had no idea about your microbiome and thereby tying it to all the things that you're feeling and experiencing. And then everything we measure is actionable. And that's another really important thing because I kept getting lots of frustrated messages from people going, hey, I have the stool test. It says, this is high. This one thing is high. Right. What, what do I do about, about that? Yeah. Right. And so, uh, and there isn't a tool or a pill to go, this pill deals with this one thing. Yeah. And so everything we test for in our, in our tests is actionable. You can actually do something about it. Right. So is that in the report? Not. That's the report. So the report comes uh, with also a, um, uh, a guide on lifestyle, diet, supplement recommendations that can modulate every, every single aspect of the report. That is awesome. But we don't talk about that enough. We talked about it when it first came out, but we mm -hmm. haven't talked about it in a while. So I wanted to mention that. Um, okay. I need to wrap up. I'm going to say thank you so much to you. March 16th. Namaste. Yeah. Thanks, Kieran. Um, we have lots of new and exciting things to talk to you about. If you have H. pylori, hang in there. I mean, that is not, that's two weeks. That's not very long to wait, as well as what else is coming out March 16th? Oh, oh back in stock is the Zen Biome, Zen Biome um, yeah. which is the um, sleep and mood. Okay, can't wait. Thanks, Karen. I'll talk to you soon. Thank you, everybody. Bye-bye. Thank you. Bye-bye. Okay, so use no bloat 15 if you'd like to go ahead and get the 15% off your entire cart in microbiome labs. And, you know, last time somebody ordered a stool test, they did use the no bloat 15 and they did get the discount on the stool test there. I'm not sure if that'll still work, but it's definitely on the supplements. I'm going to wrap up the recording that I'm going to answer a couple more questions. Thank you so much. Please do go and check out the liver gallbladder rescue summit that's been um, popped up into the chat. And then also, um, this weekend, uh, we have a special MCAS, mast cell activation syndrome class with Dr. Ann Hill, who is remarkable. And you can buy that one on your own. It's, uh, it's actually tomorrow, excuse me, ah, tomorrow. Um, it's a masterclass. And then we have two hours of Q&A. Tomorrow, we're uh, going to be doing the watch party together starting at 1. Then at 2.30, Dr. Hill is going to come on and answer uh, your questions for two hours, which is awesome. And that is $59 at the end of the month, 29th of March, 2022. We have Dr. Leonard Weinstock coming on talking about mast cell activation, long haul COVID. Uh, and he's a gastroenterologist and that one's $59. But if you want to get both of them, same setup of like watch it in advance or watch it the day of and the two hours of q a uh, if you want to get both of them at 77 dollars and um, clarissa i'm sure can, has just popped it in the in there both dr hill who's a naturopath very special and dr weinstock incredible gastro um who's very interested in rosacea ldn um, mast cell activation phenomenal they both reached out to me and dr c becker independently and said hey I really want to talk to your community about this. I have been making some discoveries in my clinic and I want to share that information. And doc, they both did it like practically the same week. Um, and we were like, yeah. We're, so Dr. C. Becker and I, every year, Dr. C. Becker, world-renowned SIBO specialist, every year we do an event together. We've been doing this since 2017. So here we are, 2022. And last year we did a conference called The Next Steps for Treating Tough SIBO. We do uh, the SIBO Pro course together. We do the SIBO Recovery Roadmap course together for patients, the others for, for professionals. And this year, instead of doing a conference, um, what we, because we've done that a couple of times, what we wanted to do was spread these master classes out over an entire year. So we have a whole series coming. This is the first of the series for the year, and we're super excited about it. Um, you can get the video on demand and watch the masterclass on your own time, or I'm doing that watch party starting at 
what time is it tomorrow? 1 p.m. Eastern time, I think. Clarissa, correct me if I'm wrong. And um, so we tried to make it as super easy as possible for everybody. And I thought it'd be cool, like watch it on your own or watch it with us and then join us for the Q&A or not. You can pre-submit your Q&As. I think that that sort of uh, the cutoff time has already happened for that. But you can join us live tomorrow. And that's at 1 p.m. Eastern time tomorrow. Okay. If you can't attend tomorrow, yes, you get the replay. This is all about you being able to go back. That's why you can pre-submit. I think the deadline's over for that. Um, but also, um, that's why we do this. So you can watch the class in advance. This replay, for example, with Karen will be sent out. Um, it's also going to live in the Facebook group. Very rarely, very rarely do we pull stuff down. We're about getting it out there. Um, the codes are in the chat, and it's no bloat 15. If you want to know how to get that stool test, it's on Microbiome Labs um, website. Um, so somebody asked a question, and I wanted to answer it. Should you continue the spores when doing the stool test? Kathleen, that's a great question. Ask Microbiome Labs, I, they, meaning that they probably have directions for you. Um, I have, okay, I know what it was. Okay. There is not, this has to do with SIBO and symptoms. There is not always a correlation between your symptoms and your gas levels. Sometimes there are, and sometimes there aren't. So this is what happens. Sometimes people take, do a SIBO treatment with antibiotics, elemental diet, or um, herbs, and they don't feel better within that first treatment round or even second treatment round. And it's, you, right? It's your personal microbiome reacting. I know people who have had levels of, you know, 180 uh, parts per million of an overgrowth and they feel as terrible. And I know some people who have had a level three and feel terrible. So it's really about your own personal situation. So when I did my first round of antibiotics for my SIBO back in whatever, 2015, 16, I took them for two weeks and I was horrified because I did not feel a difference. And I was absolutely crestfallen. But that's why Dr. Seebecker says, please retest within two weeks of finishing the first round of treatment to see if it worked, to see if your gas levels, what does it mean if it's worked? Your gas levels have come down. So that is important. It's not always a correlation of your symptoms to the overgrowth. So please keep that in mind. And also I'm trying to update my book because this one thing that I'm very excited about and that we just learned with Dr. Pimentel on um, the 14th of February, which is it's, we, I used to say location, location, location. A lot of people did. I just heard someone else, another uh, SIBO educator out there in the world. Um, I went to her webinar and she said it too. And I was like, hmm. Um, it's actually the overgrowth of the Klebsiella and the E. coli because Dr. Pimentel and Dr. Rezai have literally mapped the small intestine for the microbiome there. This is breakthrough stuff. That's why if you have not seen the Dr. Pimentel presentation from, if you have SIBO or IBS uh, or IMO, if you haven't seen the presentation from February 14th, please go to the SIBO Facebook group find it there in the media section. I don't know, Clar uh, Clarissa, if you can post it here or not and watch that presentation because so much was explained. A lot of it, if you're a regular, you've already heard, but listening to Dr. Pimentel, who is uh, the one who originally came up with the idea of the elemental diet, of uh, the IBS smart test, of the uh, uh, Trio smart test of using rifaximin for SIBO and on and on and on for over a decade has been working on this. Like he's the one who I think will be curing SIBO for us in our lifetime. Um, that is a life-changing presentation. And if you have a lot of anxiety about it, a lot of questions like, wait a minute, rah, 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 you know how that goes, that SIBO panic. I've been telling people to go watch it because I'm seeing every day people in the Facebook group who didn't watch it. And I'm like, 
He answered it in that presentation. He answered it in that presentation. So be sure to check that out. Um, and there it is. It's right there. Thank you so much, Clarissa. You're always on top of it. Okay. Um, John, go back and watch the recording. We're going to send it out to you. Um, I think, Sophie, he was saying the middle of February. Um, and I don't know about Crohn's. I know I'm so sorry we didn't get to that, Marilyn, uh, but that is a microbiome issue. I'm just way oversimplified that, as you know. Um, so please, please, the, let's see. Uh, you're welcome, Jennifer. Uh, okay. So, Sherry, go to your gynecologist and get an antifungal, okay? get a, or I've also um, I went to a presentation with um, the creator of um, Biocidin, which is Dr. Rachel Fresco. And she said you can actually use the um, Biocidin in a capsule as a suppository. So that that might help you. But I'm so sorry you're going through that because that's really the pits. Um, how can you do a detox program while taking these products or should you rebuild bio first? Okay, this is super important too, and then I will, I have to go. And so I talked about this with Dr. C. Becker and you in the last trainings that we did in January. Someone in her pro course asked, should we rebalance the microbiome and then do SIBO treatment? And Dr. C. Becker said, I totally appreciate your perspective. I totally appreciate it. It's a great question. I can totally see why you're thinking this. And she just had thousands of cases that got better without that effort. So yes, rebuild your microbiome, you know, but you do not have to have it like rehauled to get the overgrowth down. So it's a like a recipe, right? It's a creating a whole like dinner for 20. It's a whole process. Um, don't get stuck in that. And I can totally see why you're asking that question. But that was not, for her experience of treating thousands of patients, that was not an issue. Okay. Uh, okay. So somebody is having a um, candida overgrowth um, from uh, taking antibiotics, I think. And that's what I was talking about for the suppository. It's vaginally, it's very personal, but I, I did want to just say that you might want to um, get an antifungal from your doctor though. And if they just give you one fluconazole, ask for more. I'm not a doctor. I'm just telling you girlfriend to girlfriend what I would do. Um, does the Trio Smart test show what Karen's test shows? No, Gail, totally great question. Trio Smart is the breath test created by Dr. Mark Pimentel at Gemelli Labs that tests for hydrogen overgrowth, uh, methanogen overgrowth, and hydrogen sulfide overgrowth. And it is a breath test for SIBO. No stool test will give you a diagnosis of SIBO. Small intestine, bacterial overgrowth, that is, uh, stool tests are large intestine. So I'm glad you asked that question because it's a great baseline clarifying question. Stool tests are large intestine, small intestine, small intestine breath test. And what Dr. Pimentel found is that the crazy but true, the microbiomes there are so drastically different, so drastically different. And yes, the oral microbiome, just think about it. It's a tube, right? It's a tube. Of course, there's going to be, you know, up and down flow. Um, okay, so Gail, I hope that helped you. Um, you'll get the replay. <laughs> and okay, finding the media section on the website of Facebook. Hey, um, Clarissa, can you pop the Facebook group in the um, chat? But also she just put the, in the chat, she just put the link for Dr. Mark Pimentel's uh, presentation. Uh, but actually, if you click that link, you see all of the ones he's done for us over the past several years. So it's really cool to see, you know, how the progression has happened with his research, but I'd watch the most recent one first. Um, Beverly, there is a summit coming um, about trauma and the gut 
thank God there's, and have you read The Body Keeps Score? So that's an amazing, amazing book. Um, I know, I'm so sorry, Leon, Leone. Um, super sensitive people. Please, can you come to the session uh, tomorrow? Oh, uh, because Dr. Hill is very, very good with people that are super, super sensitive. She's saying that uh, she reacts to almost everything. Um, Carrie saying, check out Mega Myco Balance for uh, natural yeast overgrowth. Great idea. I'm glad you found this informative. That's great. I hope that helps. All right. There it is. Tons and tons of links for, for you. While taking and rebuilding the biome and leaky gut, can you do a full body detox at the same time or not? I mean, Sherry, I don't understand. I don't. I don't understand your personal situation. So I'm not a doctor. So detoxing, like heavy metals and all of that, mold. There's so many things you could detox, right? You really need to be working with a special person who knows how to do that properly with your binders and make sure your lymph is draining properly and that you are supported and that you are supported because detoxes are nothing to play around with. Um, I promise, yes, the, yes, Shauna, we are sending out the replay as always. Yes, yes, yes. Um, Lynn, great to see you. Okay, I'm gonna wrap. Thank you so much. Thank you, thank you. ENT issues, trust me, trust me when I tell you, ENT is related to the oral microbiome the oral microbiome is related to the gut microbiome. I never thought that I had allergies. I went to an ENT about something else. I can't even remember what it was. He put something up my nose, right? And looked around and said, oh, you have allergies. I'm like, no, I don't have allergies because my husband has allergies, seasonal allergies. And um, I'm like, I don't sneeze when there's pollen out. He goes, well, you have allergies. I'm like, okay. I normalized it. I had inflammation because I was in a moldy building for 20 years. So this is all related. Think about how close the nasal passages are to your mouth, to your brain, to your gut. I am totally convinced, as are many, many people, this is not all in isolation. That's why I did the Dental Health Connection Summit, which was very confrontational to me when I first started thinking about it four, five years ago. But I had just had a girlfriend, she had a terrible, terrible uh, tooth infection. Guess what? They're finding that she has loss of hearing in that ear. What? I asked my friend who's a biological dentist, has he ever heard of it? Yes, of course. There could be so much pressure. There could be an infection. We tend to compartmentalize things, right? That body is not compartmentalizing things. I'll tell you that right now. The forest does not compartmentalize. We are all connected. Like we can just, you know, keep talking about that as a huge analogy for everything. But if you are having dental issues, ENT issues, please get a C a cone beam um, and check to see what's going on there. And if you just Google it, you'll, you know, just Google it. Um, Oh yeah. Okay. So Jennifer is saying, yeah, your ND insists on your detox pathways are open before I do any serious detox strategy. That's awesome. You're using the drainage remedies to help open pathways. That's fantastic. Marcon's nasal testing is a must too. Yes. And I did that and I don't want to tell you what they found. Um, okay. Annie, Ani, go to Microbiome Labs and look at their stool test information. We also later on in the year are doing a stool test masterclass with Dr. Alana Gervich, which is going to be fabulous. I'm so excited. Anyway, I do really have to go. So I'm, I love you. Thank you so much. We'll talk soon. Bye, guys. Thanks, Clarissa. I always appreciate you. And um, look for the email with the recording, which we'll get out to you guys as, uh, and gals as soon as possible. You, I'm not sure when, give me a day or two. Um, we always like to get it to you as soon as possible. Peace. Thanks, everyone. Go to SIBOSOS.com for more um, and the rest of the story and a lot of the things I was just talking about. Bye.